Jonah Maddox lay in his hospital bed, sore despite the powerful pain meds that he had been given. He shook the drug-induced fog from his mind and considered the events of the past 24 hours. He had been driving down the east coast toward Florida on the first vacation he had taken in 10 years to celebrate the sale of his underground comic to one of the big publishers. His plan was to take three weeks and relax on the beach and clear his head for the exciting future that was to come. However, his plans had gotten derailed last night when he came upon the curious coastal town of Nevermore, Georgia. It was just after 10 p.m., and he had been lost for two hours on a country road that seemed to lead only deeper into darkened forest and empty fields. He was low on gas, the bright orange glow of the warning light causing his stress level to rise. It seemed he would not find a gas station in time and would be walking on a deserted road on a moonless night in the middle of nowhere. The stress only intensified when the gas light began to blink indicating he had only 10 more miles of fuel left. But just when he was sure he was done for, he saw an ornate wooden sign that said, Welcome to Nevermore, the town of wonders. He had been on the road for three days after leaving his home in Maine and had driven through several quaint little towns that harkened back to simpler times where everyone knew your name and was eager to be friendly. Nevermore had that same nostalgic charm, with the Victorian and craftsman-style homes, complete with antique street lamps and sidewalks shaded by giant oaks. However, as he drove through the town toward Main Street, he felt that something about the place seemed off. He drove past a huge Victorian home that squatted ominously behind a wrought iron fence with sharp, pointy tips as if it were some hungry beast locked away for the safety of the town. He took in the way the street lamps cast sickly pools of light onto the sidewalks and just knew in his gut that the darkness beyond them were inhabited by things hungry for his soul. He thought to himself, How on earth could I know that? After a moment, he decided it was his writer's imagination at work. The only reason this town seemed any different from any of the other quaint towns he had driven through was that this town seemed to be hidden in the middle of nowhere and that it was late at night, which painted everything he saw in a surreal gloom. He told himself that the neighborhood he drove through would probably be beautiful and inviting when painted with gilded rays of sunshine. The architecture of the homes and the beauty of the trees would be much more pleasing in bright illuminating sunlight. He turned onto Main Street, and his ominous feeling was immediately diminished by the surprising amount of people who were walking about, window shopping, drinking coffee outside a cafe, and just generally enjoying the pleasant late summer night. The antique street lamps cast healthier light than the ones in the neighborhood he had just passed, and the trunks of the trees lining the sidewalks were wrapped with strings of lights as well, giving the street a happy, relaxed atmosphere. He still had not seen a gas station, but noticed there were quite a few restaurants and diners on Main Street. He decided to find a place to work, grab a bite to eat, and ask for the closest place to gas up before hitting the road again. He was intrigued by the name of some of the shops as he drove past. To his right was Dante Inferno's Pizza. Beside it was Romero's Comics and Games. To his left was the Misfits Coffee Shop. He caught sight of a sign across the street that pointed to public parking. He turned and found a small lot with a few empty spaces and parked. He got out and headed back to the Dreamland Diner, which had caught his attention due to its colorful 1950s aesthetic. He stepped inside and seemed to step back in time. He immediately felt as if he were now in the 1950s. The place was kept immaculately clean, had red and white booths, complete with still working personal jukeboxes at each table. The wait staffed uniforms were of the era as well, including the sharp soda jerk hats. He took a seat by the window overlooking the street. The waitress bopped over. She wore a pink and white hat that matched her uniform of shirt and knee-length skirt. 
She wore a pair of black and white saddle Oxford shoes on her feet. She handed him a colorful menu and said, What can I do for you, mister? Jonah smiled because she seemed so cliche as she finished her question by blowing a bubble with the gum she chomped. He noticed her name tag. Her name was Peggy. I'll start with coffee. Black, he replied. I'll need a minute to look over the menu. Sure thing, Peggy said and took off to pour his coffee. Jonah looked at the other patrons in the diner. If they had not all been modernly dressed, he would have sworn he had stepped through a time portal. A couple of high school kids sat in a corner booth, clearly on a date. Their antique tabletop jukebox played a modern hip-hop song. Peggy bopped back over with his cup of coffee. She sat it down, pulled her order pad from her skirt pocket, and said, What do you have? Before Jonah could answer, a man pushed through the front door. He was bald and had painted a dozen strange symbols on his head and face. Jonah noticed one was an upside-down cross. The man wore ripped jeans, untied boots, and a t-shirt covered in what appeared to be blood. Everyone in the diner stopped what they were doing and stared in surprise at the man's disturbing appearance. I am the weapon of death, he bellowed to the staff and patrons. He then turned to Peggy, who stood with her eyes wide and her mouth open. He fixed her with a wild-eyed stare, and I have come to take possession of your soul. As if by some black magic, he produced a pistol. He pointed it at Peggy and pulled the trigger. Jonah felt himself bolt from the booth and jump in front of Peggy. He heard the thunderous report of the gun and Peggy's shrill scream. He felt the white-hot pain of the bullet as it slammed into his shoulder. Then, there was blackness. Now, he was awake in the Nevermore Hospital. Considering these events that had gotten him here, he was groggy from the pain meds that the doctor had ordered for him, and he was terribly sore. One of the nurses, a severe-looking woman named Brenda, was explaining to him that he was a hero. He had jumped in front of the bullet and saved Peggy. The madman had not attempted a second shot and had run out of the diner and subsequently been chased down and arrested by the sheriff and his deputies in Lovecraft Park, located in the center of town. Jonah realized that Brenda and all the nurses wore the vintage white uniforms complete with a nurse's cap. You were shot in the shoulder. There was a good bit of muscular damage, and your scapula was fractured, but the surgeon was able to patch you up nicely. He says you should recover fully with no loss of movement whatsoever. Jonah shook the drug-induced haze from his mind. I'm grateful, he said. What time is it? It's almost 10 p.m., she said. They brought you here last night after the shooting. You were in surgery for three hours. You were awake for about an hour afterward, but probably don't remember that. You were on a high dose of painkiller. Anyway, you've been asleep ever since. Jonah considered what Nurse Brenda had told him. So it's been nearly 24 hours since I was shot? That's correct, Brenda said. And the attending doctor wants to keep you here for a couple of days to make sure your recovery is good. So, it's Friday night. You should be released sometime Monday. Until then, you are to stay on the pain meds and just rest. Your body needs to heal. This is not how I expected my vacation to go, he said. Brenda pursed her lips and shook her head. Life can be disturbing at times. By the way, we are a small hospital, and all of our rooms are currently full. We have another patient that will be in shortly who will share your room. He won't be a bother because he's in a coma. This struck Jonah as strange. No modern hospital that he knew of shared rooms anymore. He remembered that Nevermore seemed to be an isolated town in the middle of nowhere, which might explain the need, so he shrugged. Sure, whatever you need to do. So, 
He's in a coma? Can you tell me what happened? Brenda narrowed her eyes in consideration of Jonah's request. Well, I'm not supposed to give out that information, she said. But considering you're sharing a room and he won't be able to call for help in his condition, I can maybe tell you just a little. So you can be aware and call us should you, know, you feel he's in distress. I appreciate it, Jonah said. I promise to keep this between us. Nurse Brenda glanced around to make sure no one else was in earshot. The truth is, Mr. Maddox, is that we don't exactly know what happened to this patient. He was found on the outskirts of town, lying in a ditch. He had some curious bite marks on his arms and neck, and he seemed to be suffering from anemia. Anemia? Jonah asked. He felt his rider's imagination kick in. You mean, like, not enough blood in his body? Nurse Brenda looked at Jonah as if he were a child. That is what anemia means. Jonah let the inference that he was an idiot slide. Forgive me. I'm a writer, and this curious little town has so much character that my imagination leaped into the supernatural. Nurse Brenda pursed her lips and scrunched her nose up in dissatisfaction. Surely you don't mean to say that you're asking if this patient was attacked by a vampire. That's absurd. Jonah shrugged. Not ashamed. Like I said, I'm a writer. I make my living telling stories. Nurse Brenda considered his response. Well then, maybe you'll get a good story out of your stay with us. She handed him another pain pill, watched as he took it, then turned and left the room, closing his door behind her. A few minutes later, an orderly pushed the door back open and wheeled in the comatose patient. The orderly had long, dark hair pulled into a ponytail. He wore the white button-down shirt and white slacks and white shoes of a 1940s hospital orderly. Hello, my name's Nate. Just dropping off your new roommate. His name is Frank. Nice to meet you, Jonah said. He watched as Nate positioned the bed across from him. Nate straightened the sheet and blanket and made sure the patient was as comfortable as possible giving his comatose state. When he finished, he turned to Jonah. Is there anything else I can do for you before I go? I'm really curious about the 1940s fashion aesthetic you guys have here, Jonah said. What's up with that? Nate shrugged. Man, I've only lived here for a couple of years, he said. But from what I've learned, the townsfolk make it a priority to brace a simpler lifestyle. They embrace modern technology, but they don't want it to replace what is good about the past. It's kind of like those quaint little Mayberry-style towns that thrive on tourism. Where never more is different is that there is no tourism to speak of. The people here just love the past and the aesthetic that came with it. So... The head honchos here at the hospital decided to continue with that whole vibe, even right down to the old school fashion here at the hospital. I find that fascinating, Jonah said. Yeah, Nate said. This town's been around for a couple of hundred years, so you're going to see a lot of old homes and storefronts with various architectural styles. They embrace all that as much as possible. It's quite a cool place to live, though. You say you've only lived here a couple of years, Jonah said. Why did you settle here? Nate smiled. I grew up in a big city. Loud, fast, life passing me by. I wanted to slow down, pursue a quieter life. I bounced around the country for a year or so, and when I got here, I loved the vibe and the pace. So I decided to stay. With that, Nate said goodbye and left the room. Jonah looked over at the man in the bed. He was a burly man with a full beard. He was pale. His eyes sunk back into his skull. Jonah thought that whatever had gotten hold of him and thrown him into the ditch must have been powerful. He looked at the man's arms, which were by his side on top of the covers. They were muscular, strong, clearly from a man accustomed to manly labor. He noticed both arms were covered in long scratches. On his right arm were what appeared to be three puncture wounds. Curious. 
Jonah felt the pain pill kick in and became woozy, groggy. As he wondered what could bring a big man like Frank down, he slipped off into sleep. Two hours later, the pain in his shoulder woke him. He rubbed the sleep from his eyes and, wincing from the pain, gingerly pushed himself up in the bed. As he felt around for the call button, he heard a strange shuffling noise coming from the hallway. His room was cast in the weak glow of a light over Frank's bed. It left the corners of the room in gloom. The door was ajar just enough to see that the hallway was shadowy due to the lights being lowered to help the patient sleep. As he became more alert, he realized the sound was less like shuffling and more like a meaty slap. He forgot about the call button and strained to listen to the curious sound. Slap. Shuffle. Scrape. Slap. Shuffle. Scrape. He realized that the air around him had grown thick. While not uncomfortable, he found that it took more effort to breathe. Slap. Shuffle. Scrape. He thought that maybe it was the pain medication that was making it more difficult for him to breathe. He closed his eyes and attempted to focus on his breathing, to get it under control so that he could explain to the nurse exactly how he felt when she got to the room. The nurse. I haven't called for her yet. He kept his eyes closed, focused on controlling his breathing, and used his left hand to feel around in the sheets for the call button. Slap. Shuffle. Scrape. He now realized that the room was warmer. In fact, it was getting hot. He opened his eyes, still finding it difficult yet not uncomfortable to breathe. He felt something inside his hand. He looked and saw that it was the call button. Yet he was unable to push it. He wheeled himself to push the large red button, but his hand simply would not cooperate. Slap. Shuffle. Scrape. The sound was louder now. Closer now. The door was only open a couple inches, and all he could see beyond that sliver of an opening was gloom. His arms and hands continued to hang limply at his sides. However, he found that he could move his head. He leaned forward and squinted, trying to see through the dark crack into the hallway. He thought he caught movement, a colorless gray against a shadowy gloom. Slap, shuffle, scrape. It was closer, louder, just outside his door. Something bumped against the door, causing it to push open another inch. He again caught sight of that colorless gray mass. The air continued to become hotter, thicker around him. Frank moaned. Jonah tore his eyes from the door and looked over to Frank's bed. He lay there, as lifeless as he had been when the orderly wheeled him in, covered in scratches and what appeared to be bite marks. Frank moaned again, a long, guttural, anxious sound. The thing in the hall bumped against the door, and it swung open another inch. Frank moaned. It was more urgent, more anxious. Slap. Shuffle. Scrape. Jonah tore his eyes from Frank and his increasingly urgent moaning. He looked at the door, fear welling up inside him. He wheeled his hands to work. He began to sweat at the heat in the room and with the effort he put forth to force his hands to work to push the damn call button. The air became thicker, hotter, and the thing in the hall bumped against the door again, causing it to swing wide. What Jonah saw as the door swung open caused his heart to flutter, then race. His mind reeled as he tried to comprehend the thing that turned and shuffled into his room. It crawled on all fours. Its skin was pale, colorless. 
It looked like nothing he had ever seen or imagined, not even in his fertile writer's mind. It moved further out of the hall and into the weak light coming from Frank's side of the room, giving Jonah his first real look at the thing. He was so terrified at what he saw that he began to cry. His mind felt stretched like a rubber band about to break. Frank moaned. No. It was more urgent, desperate. The thing shuffled completely into the dim light and stopped, as if forcing Jonah to behold every sickening detail. The thing was the torso of a human. There was no head, no hands, and no feet. Each appendage ended in a rounded nub. The arms ended in bony nubs, and the legs ended at the knees. As it crawled, the nubs would slap onto the floor, then make a moist, shuffling, scraping sound as it moved about. The neck was the most disturbing appendage. It ended with the skin puckered, as if it had been hastily sewn shut at some point. The thing stood for a moment, unmoving. Then the neck began to squirm around, as if it were somehow searching the room. The air in the room was so hot that Jonah was now soaked in sweat. He took long, belabored breaths. His terror tears rolled down his face. The thing turned its puckered nub in his direction. He could see that the skin at the center of the wound flexed as if it were sniffing the air. Frank made a pitiful mewling sound. Jonah tore his gaze from the thing at the foot of his bed and looked over at Frank. He lay there, immobile, his eyelids closed, yet the eyes behind them moving rapidly as if he were in a deep, terror-filled REM sleep. The thing turned its attention to Frank and shuffled over to his bed. Slap. Shuffle. Scrape. It used the nubs of its arms to pull itself up into a standing position beside Frank. Its puckered nub dropped down to look at the comatose man. Frank's moaning became more insistent, urgent, terrified. His eyes moved rapidly behind their lids. His breathing was quick and labored in the hot, thick air. The thing began to awkwardly climb onto Frank's bed. Jonah realized he was no longer crying. He was mentally numb. Terror and revulsion permeated every cell in his body, but his mind had reached a point of fatalistic acceptance at what he was witnessing. The thing clambered up the side of the bed and settled itself on top of Frank. Its neck nub bent down toward his face. Tears escaped from the corners of Frank's closed eyes. His moaning was pitiful, heartbreaking. A long black tongue snaked out of the thing's puckered flesh and forced itself between Frank's closed lips. Frank's eyes shot open, wide, and he stared in horror at the thing that was hovered over him. Jonah could see a snaking bulge in Frank's throat as he tried to scream. He was only able to issue a gurgling, choking sound. After an anguished moment, Frank's eyes closed, and he sank back into a deep coma. The thing retracted its black tongue from Frank's throat, raised its neck nub in a wet gurgle of victory, escaped from the puckered gash. It then maneuvered itself backward on the bed so that it could use its serpentine tongue to lick each of Frank's hands. It raised its left arm as if to look at it, though it had no eyes. Jonah could see that the nub began to sprout a series of smaller, fleshy nubs. Within a few heartbeats, Jonah could tell that the new growth was becoming a hand. It reared itself up and raised its right arm. There, too, was a new hand forming. The thing used its new hands to climb off Frank and settle back onto the floor. It began to crawl away from Frank's bed across the room. Jonah could see that it flexed its new fingers like flesh-colored spider legs as it crawled. 
When the thing reached the door, it shuffled itself around and backed out of the room. As it did, it reached up with its left hand and grabbed the door handle and pulled the door shut. Jonah could hear the thing retreating down the hallway. While the repulsive sound of the shuffling had subtly changed due to the thing using its new hands and fingers, Jonah could still hear the slap, shuffle, scrape as it made its way down the hall. With each slap and shuffle, the room cooled and Jonah was able to breathe more easily. A heartbeat after he heard the last slap and shuffle, he fell into a deep sleep. He was awakened the next morning by Nurse Brenda. She was straightening the sheets around him while the automatic blood pressure cuff squeezed his arm to take a reading. He realized he could move his body and jerked up in the bed. Check Frank, he cried, his heart racing. Hurry, there, there was a thing. It, it came into the room. It didn't have any hands or feet, not even a head. It crawled on him and... Nurse Brenda leaned over him gently but firmly forcing him back against his pillows. Calm down, she said. Take a breath, get control of yourself, and tell me what on earth you're talking about. Jonah realized what he was saying sounded crazy, but he had to make her understand what had happened. He impatiently nodded, took a calming breath. Last night, he said as calmly as he could, I heard something in the hallway. This thing came into the room and crawled on top of Frank. It did something to him. What did this thing look like? Brenda asked. Her eyes narrowed. It looked like a human torso. It had no hands, no head, and no legs or feet beyond the knee. Brenda was clearly deeply concerned. She reached over and pushed the call button. When another nurse answered, she said, Barbara, can you please send Dr. Keeney in? Barbara said that she would and disconnected the call. Brenda then turned her attention back to Jonah. You don't feel feverish, she said when she put a hand to his forehead. I'm not feverish, Jonah said. I am telling the truth. Dear, it could be the meds. You could have been having a nightmare brought on by the medicine or you could have been hallucinating. I wasn't hallucinating, Jonah said. Please, check on Frank. Look and see if he's okay. Nurse Brenda's expression of concern was tainted with disbelief. She stood and walked over to Frank. Jonah glanced over at the comatose Frank and gasped. Frank was missing his hands. His wrists simply ended in their own fleshy nubs. What happened to Frank's hands? Jonah cried. Nurse Brenda turned back to Jonah. Whatever do you mean? she asked. I have known Frank for years. He lost both his hands in an industrial accident years ago. Jonah shook his head. No, no, that's not right. He was just in a coma. When the orderly wheeled him in here last night, Frank had both of his hands. The thing licked his hands last night, and this morning they're gone. It's the thing. The thing took his hands. Just then, Dr. Keeney entered the room. What's going on here? Doctor, thank God, Jonah said. Last night, a thing of some sort came in and somehow stole Frank's hands. Dr. Keeney looked to Nurse Brenda, some unspoken understanding between them. He glanced over at Frank, then back to the nurse. He's had a reaction to the meds. No, Jonah said, his frustration evident. I'm not hallucinating. I saw a monster come into the room and take Frank's hands. I know it sounds crazy, but it isn't. Suddenly, Jonah felt his mind reel and his vision blurred. He looked over at Nurse Brenda. He saw that she had just used a syringe to administer a sedative into his IV drip. No, he said. Don't make me go to sleep. I need to get out of here. There's something terrible loose in this hospital. Then... Everything reeled as his mind tripped on the sedative and he fell into sleep. He came awake hours later. He looked over at the round clock on the wall and saw that it was after midnight. He thought, shit, whatever they gave me put me out all day. He heard a pitiful moan and turned his attention to Frank. Jonah's heart sank when he realized he was again paralyzed and the room was hot 
and his breathing labored. The thing was on top of Frank. This time, its puckered neck hovered over his feet. The thing's new fingers clawed over the sheets, eventually pulling them back to expose Frank's feet. Then, it lowered its puckered nub, snaked out its long black tongue, and began licking, starting at Frank's toes, all over the soles of his feet, and stopped at his ankles. Then, it crawled around on top of Frank and used its spidery fingers to reach and touch Frank's bearded face. The thing recoiled when it touched his thick beard, as if it were somehow disgusted at the texture. It doesn't like his beard, Jonah thought. It lifted its neck and the long black tongue licked at the air, as if the tongue could sense its surroundings. After a moment, it climbed off Frank, and Jonah could see that it now had feet. He also saw that protruding from the crumpled sheets were two rounded nubs where Frank's feet had been only moments ago. The thing pushed itself into a sitting position on the side of the bed and then stood on the feet it had somehow stolen from the comatose Frank. Now that it was able to stand, it was even more disturbing. Standing a little over six feet, with long, muscular arms and powerful legs, it took a tentative step away from Frank's bed. Its skin was still the colorless pale of a snake's belly, but Jonah thought that he could see that it was starting to model a slight pinkish in places. Its neck continued to move around, pointing its puckered end at various points around the room, the tongue snaking out, surveying its surroundings. Then... Slowly, deliberately, it pointed the neck at Jonah. Jonah gasped. Did it just realize I was in the room? It took another tentative step away from Frank's bed. Please walk to the door, Jonah prayed. Please don't come toward me. It took another step, this one more steady, confident. Please don't notice me. Please leave the room. It took a third step, very steady on its feet now. Then it shifted its body and began slowly walking toward Jonah's bed. It lifted its arms and flared out its fingers in Jonah's direction. It was clearly coming for him. Jonah's heart hammered. His breath was labored. I don't have a beard, he thought. It wants my head. Dear God, it wants my head. The fingers flexed and closed, flexed and closed, as if it were not able to accurately judge the distance, but was prepared to grasp Jonah's head when it was close enough to do so. Jonah willed himself to move his body. He felt his own fingers twitch in response to his efforts. The thing was now halfway across the room, its hands grasping. Sweat beaded Jonah's brow, streamed down his face as he forced his body to move in the stifling heat of the room. His toes wiggled, his fingers flinched. The thing took a stumbling step, caught its balance, then took another step toward Jonah. Jonah used every ounce of his will to force his body to move. He lurched up into a sitting position and cried out in victory as he felt that he now had control of his body. The long black tongue snaked out of the puckered end when he cried out and licked the air. Sensing that Jonah was about to escape, it took two more urgent steps in his direction, bringing it within three feet of Jonah's bed. Jonah was weak, but felt adrenaline coursing through his body. Sweat poured from him as he wriggled from the sheets and off the bed. He had to steady himself by putting a hand on the nightstand. My clothes, he thought. Then, screw my clothes, where are my keys? He snatched open the drawer on the nightstand and said aloud, Thank you, Jesus. The keys and his wallet were in the drawer. He snatched them just as the thing bumped into the foot of the bed. Jonah attempted to run, but the thing reached out and grabbed his hospital gown and yanked. Jonah was nearly pulled off balance, but lunged forward, slipping out of the gown, and stumbled toward the door, wearing only his boxers. He lumbered into the hall, the thing right on his heels. It seemed to have complete motor control of its body now and moved much faster. 
Jonah also had more control of his own body and ran down the dimly lit hallway, noticing that no one was attending the nurse's desk. His heart hammered as he struggled to stay away from the thing's grasp. He passed a room, shot a glance inside, and said, Oh, my Lord! A young woman lay asleep in a bed with one of the creatures on top of her. It had no hands or feet, only nubs. It was licking her face. He felt a burst of energy and was able to put distance between him and the thing that was chasing him. He reached the double doors at the end of the hallway and pushed through them into the lobby. There, he ran past two more of the creatures as he raced toward the exit. One had both feet and only one hand. The other was crawling on its four nubs, but had a tiny head growing from its neck with black sprouts of hair and one gelatinous eye. They turned toward him as he ran and lurched after him, their snake-like tongues licking the air. He hit the exit doors and ran out into the night. The parking lot was dark. There were a half a dozen cars scattered about, but no people that he could see. He heard the doors open behind him and saw that all three things were now chasing him. He took off across the parking lot, looking for where the sheriff had parked his car. He hit the panic button on the key fob, and the horn on his car blared, and his lights flashed. The car was about 40 yards away. He heard movement to his left. Coming from the bushes were three of the nub things. All of them had feet. Only one had hands. None of them had heads. They were more agile and shot off in his direction. He made it to his car, grabbed at the handle, pulled the door open and crawled inside. He slammed the door shut and locked the door just as the things reached his car. One clawed at the door, another crawled upon the hood, and its snake-like tongue began licking the windshield. Jonah fumbled the keys, finally started the car, and slammed it into reverse, noticing that someone had filled the car up with gas. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, he said aloud. He backed out of the spot tossing the nub thing on the hood onto the asphalt and running over one of the nub creatures as it jumped behind him. He felt the tires bump over the thing. He turned and slammed his foot down on the accelerator. The car shot forward. He didn't even try to avoid the nub creatures. He hit one, knocking it to the side. He hit another, felt it hit the undercarriage of the car as he rolled over it. Then he was at the end of the parking lot. He turned onto the street and shot off toward town. His heart hammering, his ears ringing from adrenaline and fear, he drove down Main Street. He glanced at the clock on the dash and noticed it was 3 a.m. The street was deserted. At the far end of Main Street, the single traffic light flashed red, casting a visceral glow. He shot through the light and out of town. After a while, his heart stopped hammering and he was able to think more clearly. He drove through dark countryside for what seemed like hours, seeing no person or animal. There were no signs, and he feared he was lost and was terrified of seeing more of those nub creatures walking about in the dark fields. Just when he was about to give up hope, he came around a steep curve and saw the most glorious thing he had ever seen. A sign just ahead. It said, Food. Lodging. One mile. Thank God. I made it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He drove around another curve, and then his heart sank. There before him was a wooden, ornate sign. It said, Welcome to Nevermore, a town you just can't leave.